It is an honor to rise in support of the budget 2022 crafted under the team steadfast against all challenges, resolute in building our one Guyana. Budget 22, 2022 was presented by one of the best minds in Guyana, Dr. Ashni Kumar Singh, and articulates the vision of the PPPC government and President Irfan Ali for all of the people of Guyana. It includes tangible measures for the poor, the elderly, students, and the future for among others, and sets out a clear path as to the legacy that we are creating and the steps to a future that is bright for every one of us. Well, Mr. Speaker, before I continue, I want to comment on the, the previous speaker from the other side, not the last one, the previous one, Honorable Katri Hughes, who referred to our member on this side, the Honorable Onich Waldron as Judas. Her attack, her attack on the integrity of a distinguished member who served the bar, a member who has returned to this country to Mr. serve our country, a member who has Mr. renounced Speaker. her citizenship to serve this country, and we must respect and ask Mr. for an equality. The fact Mr. remains, Mr. Speaker, the honorable Mr. member submitted her document. Our honorable minister, honorable member, Ms. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, fourth standing order, four to be, I never called any particular person a Judas. I would like the Parliament to review the answer and clarify that. Honorable Member Weaver, Honorable Minister, please. Mr. Speaker, the previous the previous member referred to disregard for the Constitution. May I remind the Honorable Rosdale Ford, who appointed the former GCOM chairman, a very fit and proper Justice Patterson, breaching the Constitution, who ignored the Constitution, squatting in government, who refused to abide by the no confidence motion. Who, after rounding up and checking which bottle is large and which is smaller, could not determine that tartary was all that is required to be a majority in 65, and comes here to speak about breach of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, Budget 2022 will allow the Ministry of Housing and Water to provide more house lots and more houses to more citizens who are waiting to build their own homes. The banks will, for the very first time, offer the lowest mortgage interest rates in the history of the country, and portable water will become accessible to more communities for the first time including hinterland communities. But sadly, Mr. Speaker, the aspirations of Budget 2022 are getting muddied because the members on the other side continue to come to this house unprepared, ill-informed, making wild accusations of corruption, and quite frankly, seem disconnected from the realities that are confronting this country. Realities that they do not have the knowledge, expertise, or exp experience to confront. Don't, don't, don't. Mr. Speaker, imagine the Honorable Ferguson came to this house and said that housing is a major issue in our country. And I agree, housing is indeed a challenge that's confronting us. And yet, 
under the stewardship of her government, this sector had no clear structure or focus. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, the honorable member said that the housing and water sector is dear to her heart. And indeed, it's probably dear to her heart because when we took over, we found no documents in the, in the computer system. We found no reports in the office. Even the Christmas tree that was purchased for the minister's office could not be found. It Mr. was the start of the housing sector, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, Ms. Ferguson. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand on standing order 40B. The honorable member is accusing me of stealing a Christmas tree. I would like to honorable, honorable so Ms. ensure that an investigation He never is accused you. And that is what he's trying he to do, Mr. Speaker. You. Continue, honorable minister. If the cap fits you, pull the string. It will starve the housing sector, Mr. Speaker, will starve the funds. Actual investments, which included budgetary allocations, the housing fund and the IDB loan funds to the work over the five year period totaled only $17 billion. Compare that, Mr. Speaker, to the 18 months in office where we have already injected over $24 billion in this sector. The PPPC government has injected billions of dollars into this sector, and therefore, we will return viability to this sector. A measly 7,534 house lots, which obviously did not dent the backlog of 70,000 which we when we entered into office that we met. They did not spearhead any innovative project. They did not introduce any transformative intervention in the housing sector. But these members come here and at every budget with these lame ramblings and often nothing constructive. The points of these debates should not be lost on us or should not be taken for granted. This is a great opportunity to bring awareness to the plans and policies that we will inform the nation on the work of our ministry. It also demonstrates that the PPPC government has a clear plan for development for this country. And we will execute the plan without fear, not COVID-19, nor floods, nor rising prices, nor the absence of a credible opposition, opposition leader will stop us. We have a country to build. The dreams of our citizens to help come true and a legacy of this nation to create. And nothing our friends across the floor can do to stop us. Nothing. Mr. Nothing. Speaker, sometimes I think some of the members on the other side play too much, spend too much time in the ring singing tra la 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 and not even enough time familiarizing themselves with the policies of our government. Why else will the Honorable Member Ferdinand ask about the plan for children who are squatting? It is public information that we have more than a plan since even true parliamentary questions is not enough for them you still have Google as your friend. Honorable Mr. Speaker, we have a plan. It is called the Guyana Strategy for Informal Settlements, Upgrading and Prevention. Mr. Speaker, it is the PBPC government that started a comprehensive housing program after taking office in 1992. And that program included interventions for squatting. We have created a database that captures information on the squatter settlements across the country 
so that investments can be done and interventions can be done targeted and impactful as a result. We have regularized over 750 informal settlers in regions four and five over the last year. We have relocated 59 persons squatting on government reserves. And in some cases, and in some instances, when it was necessary, we even compensated. Mr. Speaker, in the five years of the coalition government, they relocated only 20 families from Broad Street. Google is your friend, honorable member. Try it. Mr. Speaker, when we left office in 2015, the construction, and I'm going to use the East Bank Corridor as just one example of the, our vision in terms of the housing sector and the plans for Guyana. When we left office in 2015, the construction and the upgrading of the Interlink Road from Mocha to Great Diamond, the construction of the four-lane highway from Mandela to Eccles, the development works from Prospect to Great Diamond had begun. More than $10 billion were already expended on new housing areas in Eccles, Herstelling, Farm, Covent Garden, Perseverance, Peters Hall, Diamond, and Mocha. But, Mr. Speaker, at a time when Guyana had discovered oil and the citizens and investors were hungry for land, for residential, commercial, and industrial purposes, the coalition was, as we've proven all week, they were like headless chickens. They played musical chairs with the stewardship of the ministry, practically downgrading it to a department and were indecisive. They were vacuous. They were vapid. They were insipid. They stopped the progress, Mr. Speaker. Imagine, they were handed a fully conceptualized project. Lands that were earmarked and acquired and infrastructure works that had started. And yet they could not complete the implementation of a single one of these projects. This lack of vision, this lack of leadership resulted in years of delay higher developmental costs due to inflation, exasperated the demand for houses, lots, and commercial and industrial lands, and was overall just appalling management for a critical sector of this country. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker, and therefore it pains me when our friends across this house come here and nitpick and denigrate the work that we are doing now. We were left with a basket to fetch water, but we took on the challenge and we have breathed new life into the stagnation left behind by the coalition. We restarted the very construction of the upgrade of the interlink road from Mocker to Great, Great Diamond. We have constructing right now, which will be completed by the end of this month, the Mandela to Eccles four lanes. The construction of the four-lane highway from Eccles to Great Diamond, which we consider phase two, we have already paid mobilization advance. Infrastructure development works from Prospect to Great Diamond. Construction of more than 500 young professional houses at Prospect and Providence, and more than 200 low-income houses at Prospect. Mr. Speaker, I only gave you the example of East Bank because if I'm going to speak about the entire housing sector and the intervention of all layers and of all areas in this country, we will be here all afternoon. This reminds me, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Flubes member highlighted through pictures a number of communities that, according to her, required urgent attention of the government. I am baffled by this call because Comrade Flubes is the opposition MP for that East Bank corridor, as well as a resident of Mocha. So she should be more au fait with what is happening there. And by that I mean beyond merely waving around some pictures. So allow me 
to brief this House, Honorable Mr. Speaker. Parstelling is also known as the area as Cane View, or as an extension of Moko Arcadia. It is a rural informal settlement situated in a portion of reserved land. This settlement is bounded by Gaisuko to the west and a drainage stretch to the east. No physical infrastructure, electricity or water distribution network had been installed in this area. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, this portion of land that the residents occupy is a reserve which has to be observed in the construction of the Eccles to Great Diamond four-lane highway. Mr. Speaker, I went there myself with the CHPA team. We met the residents, 35 households to be exact, and we discussed the situation with a view to arriving at a mutually satisfactory solution. We identified housing areas to which the settlers will be relocated, plantation, horse telling, and farm. I'm happy to report that these residents have been allocated house lots at no cost to them. The valuation department provided valuations for their structures, which reflects the current market value of each property. So far, 21 households have been fully compensated. 20 house lots have been allocated, 15 at horse telling and five at farm. Each household will receive financial compensation in full based on that valuation. These citizens are expected to be relocated within three months of receiving their compensation. And as at February 1st, Mr. Speaker, 13 of the allotted persons have begun construction of their new homes. And I don't need to show you. This is an example at farm house under construction. This is at her telling the very area that the honorable member condemned. Mr. Speaker, this is what happens when you have a government that will reach out to its citizens, listen to their concerns, and then work together to find solutions. We will very soon issue them with their land titles free of cost. I am happy now that they will be resettled in a more cohesive, sustainable, and safe community safely that they can legally access electricity and water, experience an improved quality of life, perhaps more importantly, be proud owners of their own homes. I rather suspect, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member Flubes is not happy that her party attempts to derail the resettlement of these poor citizens did not succeed and I can say this too. The honorable member was even annoyed that I went to the area and didn't even inform her of our attempts to engage the villagers. Let me get back to the highlights we took on since coming back into government. The financial investments on the East Banks alone is more than $15 billion. Mr. Speaker, we have completed the acquisition of more than 2,000 acres of land east of the Diamond Housing Scheme. We have completed the design and layout of new housing areas within this zone. We have begun infrastructure works for the construction of 1,000 young professional units. And this does not include the young professional houses to be constructed at LBI or the moderate income houses currently being constructed at Cummins Lodge. Mr. Speaker, we have not shied away from the challenges that were thrown our way. We committed to allocating a total of 50,000 house lots within our first term, and we were well on track to do so. The $12.4 billion allocated this year will allow us to continue to develop the infrastructure of the targeted areas through the upgrading of roads, construction of drains and installation of lead street lights and completing distribution networks for electricity and water. Compare that, Mr. Speaker, on the very East Bank for the five years they were in office, 
all they did were two small developments which were attempted by the coalition, that is at Peters Hall phase three and Providence phase four. Oh Mr. Speaker, we have already surpassed the house lot's target set for the first 18 months by allocating more than 10,000 to date. We have handed out under 1,500 land titles and transports. We have built 50 low-income houses at Prospect, 133 moderate income houses at Commons Lodge, Whoa. under Neeming and Amelia's Ward, 100 houses for young professionals at Providence. These are all complete. We have distributed 228 home sub improvement subsidies to the tune of $114 million and have significantly upgraded infrastructure housing developments in regions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, and 10. The combined totality of our achievements in under two years far outweighs those of the members on the other side during their five-year reign of taxes. Mr. Speaker, the past 18 months have not been only seeing us resuscitate the housing sector, we have also sought to make the services offered at the agencies connected to the Ministry of Housing and Water more accessible to citizens. We recognize that meeting the demands of our citizens for approvals by local and national investors and customers for the CHPA require a faster and more efficient solution. Our government has committed to making doing business much easier and reducing the red tapes involved in government transactions. The present system for approval for permits is paper-based, cumbersome, time-consuming, and as a result, critical transactions can take months, in many cases, to be completed. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry has already begun the process of implementing the single window electronic processing system. Technicians are conducting an analysis of the existing system and its infrastructure, and a new system is being designed. Meanwhile, the anticipated recommendations on legislation and governmental changes to enhance the efficiency of the system are being advanced. When the full implementation of the electronic single window system is complete, this year we can expect a more integrated agency approach to services, more efficiency, and a significant reduction of processing time for planning and building permits. Mr. Speaker, we have already created an online portal which allows house lots applications to uphold, upload their applications from the comfort of their own homes or in the comfort of Eccles Block DD. We have, Mr. Speaker, allow you, you can use smartphones, tablets, laptops, or similar devices. Once these documents are uploaded, the CHPA will issue an email acknowledging receipt. I hasten to point out, though, that we know that everyone has access to computers, so those officers those applications and the applicants, we can have them verified at the office. I hope the Honorable Member Flubes will share the information with her constituents. Mr. Speaker, not only are we strengthening the systems at the Ministry, we are cognizant of the challenges that the allottees encounters. We are ensuring that when they are able to find financing for the construction of their own homes. Since 2020, there have been incremental increases in the low income mortgage loan ceiling. In 2020, it was raised from $8 million to $10 million. In 2021, from $10 million to $12 million. And in budget 2022, it is further raised from $12 million to $15 million. This increase will allow the banks to approve a higher number of mortgage annually, thereby making home ownership even more attainable. This, Mr. Speaker, coupled with the reinstatement of the $30 million mortgage interest relief, would put more disposable income 
in the hands of our citizens, which they can use now for renovations and refurbishment or even for savings. The reinstatement of the mortgage interest relief ceiling has seen a significant increase in the applications to the Guyana Revenue Authority. In 2019, GRA paid over $354 billion. In 2020, $419 million. In 2021, an increase, a 40 increase of over $552 million. Mr. Speaker, when the Honorable McDonald spoke to this House, she said that the budget should have provided for subsidies, for subsidized mortgages, free handouts, free vouchers, free housing for Guyanese. I'm not sure which budget she's referring to because those interventions I've just explained is in the very way being addressed in this budget and the very subsidies she's asking for. The home improvement subsidies and the core home support are also subsidies. Similarly, the support for our dialysis patients for the, to the tune of $600,000 per year is also a subsidy. The uniform grant for our children is also a subsidy. The Because We Care grant is also a subsidy. Honorable McDonnell, you asked for subsidies. Budget 22 gave you subsidies. Mr. Speaker, the water sector that we inherited was overstaffed. Its management was reckless with its financial resources. There was a high water loss and access to portable water seemed an impossible dream for many communities. But hard as it was, we immediately set about to crafting a strategic plan for this sector, establishing a national water council, introduce new water supply systems in the hinterland, enhance the water quality, dug new wells across this country, expanded the water treatment coverage, as well as returning the water subsidy to the poor and vulnerable. We didn't complain. We just went to work. These are the real benefits of having a budget such as this one. And this is why I'm a proud member of the People's Progressive Party civic government to be here to support this budget. Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure that all Guyanese are provided with a high quality water service. And the new strategic plan that are articulated by clear objectives and targets they are focused in our vision for GWI. These goals are in alignment with the PBPC's government manifesto and our mandate towards UN Sustainable Goal 6, which is to ensure that access to water and sanitation for all. Mr. Speaker, we have reduced the financial burden for citizens by removing the VAT and potable water for all categories and this is at a cost of $644 million annually. Reinstated the water subsidy for pensioners. Here is another subsidy for you, Comrade McDonald. And further reduce water tariffs across all categories of customers by 5% to ensure that we have equitable economic relief to the value of $202 million annually to GWI. Mr. Speaker, Government expended, this PBPC government expended over $3.4 billion to restore the potable water subsector. In this regard, we've completed the construction of the new wells at Wakenham and Luziknan. We have significantly advanced the drilling and construction of new wells at Providence, Diamond and Parika Bagdam, which will provide improved water service to more than 80,000 residents by the fourth quarter of this year. GWI has already completed the identification of areas for the construction of a number of new water treatment plants. These include Walton Hall to Charity in Region 2, Wakenham, Leg 1 in Region 3, Bushlock in Region 5, Tain to Number 50 Village in Region 6. This will increase the treated water, the coverage to approximately 63% by the end of this year on the coastal population. We have committed, Mr. Speaker, 
to mobilizing funding for the construction and the installation of water treatment facilities in Tamout Menard to Good Hope in Region 2, Wales Canal No. 2 to Free and Easy and Parfait Harmony in Region 3, Providence and Collingen in Region 4. And before you get to Region 5, you need an extension. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask that the Honourable Member be given five minutes more to conclude his presentation? Thank you, Minister Tashira. Honourable Minister, you may continue and conclude in five minutes. Mr. Speaker, this will ensure that 90% of treated water coverage is reaching our coastland household within the next three years, which includes the expansion of our distribution network. Mr. Speaker, under the hinterland program, we have completed success, successful completion of the drilling of a new number of new wells. And therefore, by the end of this year, we will increase our hinterland water coverage to over 80%. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable, Ms. Honorable Sinclair stood before this House to boast of the levels of the previous administration, but could have only named one, the Madia Water Supply System. At the same time, he called in the PVP administration to establish more portable water wells for our remote communities of Region 8. Like his colleagues, he too seems blissfully unaware of the developments that are taking place in his own backyard. I wish to inform the Honorable MP, who claims to represent Region 8, that a water supply system and distribution network that serves the people of Princeville via stance pipes existed prior to the coalition tenure. And in North Pacorimus, for example, there are water systems and distribution networks in Kato, Kukabaru, Kamana, Kanapang, Kopinang, and Waipo. Mr. Speaker, there are provisions in this budget for a water supply for Itabak, while works are going on in Kaibarupai, and GWI has already made proposals for water systems in Mike Walk and Sand Hills. Mr. Speaker, over the next three years, our government intends to close the gap to the, water, the portable water system in the hinterland. To achieve this, the government is committed to financing to some $3.5 billion in capital investment during this period and use, ensure that we maximize the use of surface water and water harvesting, which will benefit more than 49,000 hinterland and riverine residents. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to providing access to potable water services to the population, not only as a personal target, but as a support to the UN Sustainable Goal. Mr. Speaker, I can go on all about the budget 22 will bring us, but time is catching up, and I would like to give you an update on the pace of the development of the Silica City. The idea of this city, which was born out of the need for Guyana to have an urban center that is complementary to the existing capital city of Georgetown, which was conceptualized in 2013. The vision for the Silica City is the creation of a vibrant, sustainable, resilient, and modern city. And this vision is keeping in keeping with our low carbon development strategy, Guyana's international commitment to the Paris Agreement and UNFCC. The smart city is proposed for creating a new city that will compact and will have pedestrian oriented, energy efficient, interconnected and sustainable, comfortable, attractive and secure environment. It is envisaged, Mr. Speaker, that over the next 20 years, the projected population for this new city will be approximately 50,000 occupants or over 12,500 households. Therefore, within this first five years, it is expected that this city would be developed to cater for at least 3,125 households, approximately 625 units annually. Mr. Speaker, consultations are ongoing with the utility companies as I speak 
to coordinate the development of the infrastructure since it is anticipated that a shared utility corridor will cater for all utilities to be routed and underground. So, Mr. Speaker, in light of the facts, as I conclude, I've highlighted over these past few minutes, I'm convinced that Budget 22 is good for our country, and I am proud to support it. It has no new taxes, includes more benefits for ordinary citizens. It projects that the construction sector will grow to 40.3% and presents a clear and cohesive plan for Guyana's development or trajectory. I'd like to call on the opposition members, therefore, to embrace Budget 2022, share it and support it. We want the same thing, a united Guyana, a developed Guyana, one Guyana. With that, Mr. Speaker, I pledge my support to Budget 2022.